Okay. Hi, everyone. Hope this will work out somehow. Hi, everyone. Much nicer this way. Okay. Can, can you hear? I don't hear an echo. This time seems to be sort of fine. Okay. Perfect. Hello. Thanks for the invitation to speak here, and it's good to connect. Okay, that was that was good. That was nice. <laughs> okay, so thank you again, everyone, for the patience. This again really goes to show that theoretical physicists are are useless people. Um, so I'm I'm glad we all had to experience that <laughs> um, uh, for the hubris. Good. So the first question I really wanted to ask everyone, and we'll go in, in this order again. So we'll go me, and then uh, after I finish, let's go Alexia, Marcus, then. Massimo and Nicole, and then we can go John and Zoe. Um, so the first question, very easy question. Um, do quantum computers heat up? Um, how do they heat up and why should we care? So that's my first question. So let's go to Alexia. But do you really think this is an easy question? <laughs> I would say it's the purpose of the work of many people for many years, I think. Um, because first of all, quantum computers, we I mean, they don't really exist yet. I mean, in the sense they were promised 20 years ago, uh, it's a job of many people to, to build them. And, um, so what we are, uh, defending and, uh, and working on with, uh, more and more people is to say that, um, if quantum computers are interesting initially interesting for like brute performance purposes like we imagine that the quantum computer it will compute faster uh, there may also be advantages in the energy that they consume to compute so this quantum energy advantage but i would say that this is a research line by itself which again will take a lot of time which require to build up a completely interdisciplinary research line with industrial, with fundamental physicists, with quantum thermodynamicists, for instance. And, um, and so I'm, I'm curious to see the answer. <laughs> so my question, your question actually brought another question. <laughs> okay. I, I must say I wholeheartedly agree with Alexia on everything she said so far. I think it's it's really like we don't have quantum computers yet and this is the one question many of us are set out to explore. Um, uh, the only thing I would like to add as a part of, uh, like from my own perspective, um, th th there seems to be two, two kinds of heat when talking about computing and two types of energy consumption, right? I mean, one of them, and, and I feel as a field we do good, we do well to separate them neatly. One of them is kind of the, the heat and work expenditure from classical control, just the inevitability of non-perfectly isolated quantum computing systems, whatever they may be. And the other more information theoretic inherent bounds like Landauer erasure, irreversibility in the operations themselves. And while these two are vastly different orders of magnitude, I think there's reason to care about both of them. One for performance and error correction, the other really in terms of like classical energy consumption of computers. Uh, I perfectly agree with the perspective of Alexia and Marcos. And I like to view the <clears throat> this thermodynamic cost from a more classical perspective, if you like. I mean, after all, um, most of the interest of the thesis of computation originates from this very question. I mean, how much, what is the intrinsic thermodynamic cost? I mean, the Landauer principle was, was basically uh, the answer to this. And I'd like to point out that, uh, again, there is an intrinsic cost due to the information erasure, but there's also this interesting paper, so early work by, by Bennett, who is a chemist, by the way, and you can tell it from his early work. I mean, he, he was interested in Brownian computer and Brownian computation in which in principle you do a 
perfectly reversible, logical reversible computation, and you drive the computation one way and another by by uh, imposing a, a, a slight bias. That this would uh, at the same time induce energy losses. So there's a trade-off between the speed at which you do computation and the amount of information you lose and, and the thermodynamic cost of what you do. I mean, again, uh, already at a classical level, it's interesting to go back to these early um, uh, questions. And on, on top of this, on the quantum case, this would uh, add the important question, I mean, how much uh, information we must erase in order to do quantum error correction? What is the quantum information flux? So is, is the the quantum bit of information, which is the extra ingredients. But I mean, part of the questions are already there and we don't have full answer to all of them in my viewpoint yet, at least. Of course, I agree with those who spoke earlier. I'll add a little bit by saying, giving some examples of where heat comes into the physical platforms. For starters, thinking, think about a superconducting qubit quantum computer. You have a bunch of superconducting qubits on a chip. The chip is controlled by control wires. The control wires need to um, partially be on the chip and they also partially go into, or the other ends of them connect to the machines that experimentalists will use to control the superconducting qubits. The control mechanisms are classical. So they aren't as cold as the quantum computer. They sometimes can't operate in the temperature regimes at which the quantum computer itself operates. So the classical control mechanisms contribute heat that disturbs the quantum computer. In another example, think about ultra cold atoms, say in a simulator, you, if you have a bunch of ultra cold atoms or let's say atoms that are kind of cold and you wanna cool them down even more, then you have some options for how you can cool them. And one way is evaporative cooling. It's kind of like taking a, a tub of water and letting the hot molecules evaporate from the surface. What's left is colder than the system that you initially had. So evaporative cooling does allow the hotter molecules to go away. The problem is um, you lose some computational degrees of freedom when these uh, uh, particles, because of their high energy, are lost to the environment. And also when you measure these systems, you kind of blast the particles out of their sites. So uh, it's really interesting to see actually how heat and um, disturbance to quantum computers manifests in different platforms. hear me? Cool. You can hear me better now. Um, so just an, an idea I toyed with a while ago, and actually I think a few papers have come out on it recently. Um, they're all pretty heuristic. It's not clear to what extent you can actually control the noise enough to produce interesting thermal states. Um, but hey, I'm just going to throw this out there as a fun alternative thought in terms of the relationship between heat and quantum computing. Yeah, so I guess um, I, I, the first thing, maybe I can make some comments because at the end, you know, many things have been covered. Um, in relation to Marx's point, you know, I come agree with him that, I mean, in some sense, if you want to the initiative or, you know, thermodynamics of quantum computation, generally you have to sort of partition or the thermodynamics part of running your particular hardware apparatus and the energetic cost for that on many platforms sort of you know, completely overwhelms any energetic contributions in relative to logically irreversible information processing on the device or the cost of performing feedback control for error correction. So like, they're at completely different energy scales in physics. On the one hand, you have, I would say, a classical engineering problem 
if you want to be more efficient in your energy, you should probably work more on high temperature superconductivity so you don't actually have to use a cryostat, which is the sort of dominant source of you know, energy in a, in a, in a superconducting-based quantum computer. Um, on the other hand, you know, analyzing the sort of thermodynamics of logically irreversible operations, the thermodynamics of error correction from a basic science perspective is, you know, very interesting and something, of course, that, you know, I've been working on for a while and other people, um, of course, and it's an old problem. Um, maybe one more comment is that I, I'm not sure um, something that Alexia m mentioned with respect to you know, quantum advantages in thermodynamics. I mean, I remain rather skeptical, um, you know, in the sense that I'd like to see some concrete examples of that. Um, I'm not convinced that there are so many. And if they are, the question is, are they relevant at macroscopic scales to any sort of, you know, kind of uh, sustainability issue? I, I doubt it, but uh, that's my point. Um, so thank you all for your contributions to the first question. Um, I'd like to maybe prompt you a bit to discuss uh, the, the, really the following idea. So what is the, the source of this thermodynamics? Like, okay, we all agree that these things seem to heat up. Um, we, you maybe briefly touched on the origin of this noise, perhaps, but... Is there any thermodynamics you envisage which is perhaps intrinsic to the computation itself? Or is it just, uh, is it just measurement, for example? Or does the uh, creation of correlations during a computation contribute thermodynamically? Um, are there external sources of, of thermodynamics you see um, uh, sneaking in, uh, environmental noise. So I'd just like you guys to maybe give us your thoughts on the different origins of this uh, thermodynamics. And maybe we can start in the opposite direction uh, from John and work our way back up to Alexia. Yeah. It's, it's a similar question, similar but again, again, you know, it is known that, you know, with respect, I mean, I think what was nice, which was to separate a computer into an information-bearing degree of freedom and a non-information-bearing degree of freedom. The non-information-bearing degree of freedom is the sort of substrate, the environment on which the, the quantum computer is sort of computing. And then you have the, you know, the sort of um, you know, information-bearing degree of freedom in your circuit or whatever. And he showed, of course, that you know, logically ir irreversible process have um, an intrinsic sort of dissipation associated to that. And Again, I stress that that's bound. The amount of heat that comes from such an operation you know, pales in insignificance with the energetic cost of running a fridge. correlations, um, does irreversibility have a thermodynamic cost, but that, yeah, completely pales in significance to the actual practical considerations, the practical considerations in terms of cooling everything down, and then also the practical considerations in terms of noise, interactions with the environment, uncontrollable interactions that we simply can't sort of characterize completely because it's a far too complex system, and yet has an impact on any of the calculations we try and do. Um, and to be honest, I'm more interested in that side of things. Like, can we use what we understand about thermodynamics to help understand how to build better error mitigation protocols, how to actually make a practical difference to make our calculations better? And that's not going to be taking into account ideas about the effect of correlations or irreversibility. That's going to be really pretty damn practical. It's going to be based on our understanding of the underlying models. I, I agree with what's been said. said. And I'm hearing an echo as well. Let's see. Has, yes, it sounds like the microphone in the, in the room has now been muted. So I, I agree with what has been said about the two sources um, or two, let's say, groups of sources of noise and heat in quantum computations. And I'll second what Zoe was just saying. There is a really rich and creative field of engineering dissipation in order to 
say, perform state preparation for an interesting tangled state or perform quantum error correction. And it's, it's I think, a wonderful perspective to embrace our enemies and try to form allies with them instead, the allies being the environment. I think it's my turn. I, mean, uh, I will slightly, well, I, of course, I agree perfectly with what has been said so far, but would rather uh, ask another question rather than giving an answer. I mean, it would be interesting to look at thermodynamic cost in computation in, in forms of quantum or computation, which are in a way another quantum, but in which the noise itself is the origin of, of is the computational resources. I'm thinking about uh, uh, paradigms like a reservoir computing or, or neuromorphic kind of computation in which there is not even a clear distinction between what are the computational degrees of freedom and what is the environment. And I don't, of course, I don't have any answer at all. I mean, what would be the, how to deal with dissipation in this new framework of, compu uh, of, 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 of computing paradigm. But I think it's something which is interesting to look at. So it's more a question than, than, than an answer, if you like. Yeah, um, seems to agree so much. So I'll, I'll say something more provocative. I do agree with everything, but I feel like uh, I agree and disagree with Alexia and John and everybody else in the sense that uh, there could be advantages for quantum in a thermodynamic sense, but there could also be disadvantages. Like the more you look into, like. For instance, say erasure classically, you just want to erase a bit and it can be encoded in some really redundant degrees of freedom and you don't need to work so hard because in the end you're not, you're not required to be able to create coherent superpositions of those. To actually erase a quantum bit or prepare coherent quantum bits might actually be more costly than erasing a classical bit, even energetically. So, there, there might be some genuine quantum disadvantages as well, that understanding them better could be a path towards understanding the limitations or uh, better routes towards practical quantum computing too. And uh, of course, but I also agree there could be some quantum advantages also energetically. The question is again, like quantum computing, one of scalability, right? I mean, we all know, like there's all of these examples where like a three qubit engine outperforms some classical thermodynamic equivalent, but I, I guess on most scales this is really um, really irrelevant unless this effect can be made to scale in a sense that I mean, but I could imagine that there's say a thermoelectric that autonomously converts a heat current into electricity and by using quantum effects does so scalably more efficient than any classical process could do. That's not out of the question. Should I speak Should now? I, speak? I hear yes, the please, sorry. Yeah, I, I'm, okay. So yeah, it's, uh, again, this is a very big question and uh, it, it, it would require the probably uh, years of work from, from lots of people. But uh, so I, I pick one point that uh, I care a lot, particularly, which uh, to me is a good way of analyzing the energy cost of quantum computing, which is the fact that uh, basically a quantum computer, it's a Schrodinger cat state. What you want to do is basically to prepare a Schrodinger cat state, which is a highly non-equilibrium state in the sense that uh, the environment wants to let your cat decohere. Uh, and so what you have to pay is actually the cost of, of letting your cat in the box. So uh, and this encapsulates uh, the preparation, the fight against the noise uh, in, in different ways. So for me, that's, that's a very nice way of understanding where we should work uh, to formalize uh, the energy cost of quantum computing. And um, so we're going to come back to this quantum advantage stuff because I'm afraid uh, in 30 seconds, uh, John thought I was a believer, which actually I'm not, as I, 
I'm an agnostic. I'm just pretending this is something worth investigating. We don't have all the tools now because the tools, they also go through uh, interdisciplinary work. And what I would like uh, by mentioning there can be a quantum energy advantage is a change of paradigm for the people who are currently building the quantum computer. Because if you discuss with quantum tech people, um, this is not what they think first about. While I think this is something that must be optimized in the same way you want to optimize the quantum computing performance. So it's more in the direction of a change of mentality that I'm putting this on the table rather than on the fact, yeah, uh, it will happen and, 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 and that's it. But uh, I'm an agnostic. I work to investigate this. Okay. Um, if, Alexa, could you mute yourself, please? Okay, thank you. Um, so, so thank you again, all of you. I'm starting to calm down now that the audio is nice. Um, um, so for the next question, and, and maybe again, now we can reverse the order and have Alexia start again. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that this is of interest to everyone, so if you don't feel like commenting, feel free to, to skip this one out. But I was wondering what you guys think quantum computers can teach us, or can they even teach us, about long-standing, maybe foundational questions in thermodynamics themselves, sort of like, I don't know, the measurement problem, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Can uh, quantum computers help us answer these questions or, or other ones that, that you might have in mind? Yeah, so actually uh, I will just bounce back uh, on to what I just said before, which is I really think beyond the uh, system dependent, hardware dependent questions related to the energy cost of quantum computing, the deep, deep question uh, could be formulated like what is the minimal uh, energy cost of creating a Schrodinger cat state? And I think uh, by searching in this direction, what is the minimal energy cost of performing a quantum computation, taking into account the classical control, the cost to isolate the system, etc. This can bring new ideas on uh, the quantum to classical boundary. Uh, so I, I think uh, quantum technologies can help us addressing these questions with new flesh, new thoughts. Um, yeah, the energy cost of of creating a Schrodinger cat state. That would be my answer. Yeah, I, I guess my I, I have a similar answer. Um, I think, I mean, to some sense, a lot of the measurement problem and what you mentioned, like ETH and other things are really questions about the emergence of irreversibility and where it comes from. And there, I mean, and, and the quest for a quantum computer is sort of a complex, quantum many body system not feature too much irreversibility, right? Because, I mean, after all, most of a quantum computation should be a unitary and thus reversible. And so the question really is how to avoid it and to what extent this is possible and whether at some complexity scale new effects appear. So absolutely, I maybe from a different, slightly different angle, I agree with Alexia that, uh, that studying this will reveal whether there is something to be said about these foundational issues or not. I mean, and it's, and it's I, I'd say it's well worth it because we have a clear indication that these should be connected. Yes, uh, again, uh, that is easy. I mean, <laughs> I agree with my previous, uh, with, with, with Marcos and with, uh, with Alexia. And I would particularly uh, stress uh, the analogy between quantum computing device and many body system. Again, because this, uh, uh, this analogy between the dynamics of a many body system and a quantum computer can hold beyond the standard gate paradigm, because it is something which, again, with different kinds of, of computational paradigm can, can survive. I mean, again, so it, the two things are definitely linked together, both from the point of st quantum statistical physics, if you like, and but also from the point of average mean field, I mean, thermodynamics, or, or 
or criticality classes, I mean, this kind of problem. But again, uh, the analogy between many body physics and quantum computing device goes, I think, by the point beyond the standard uh, um, quantum gate paradigm or quantum computation. I'd like to jump off this mention of many body physics and what perhaps uh, Massimo had in mind, which is we have not only digital quantum computers, but also analog quantum simulators. Those have already been useful in opening up a lot of thermodynamic material. It's not necessarily been in what we would conventionally call quantum thermodynamics. It's more in many body physics, atomic molecular and optical physics, and condensed matter. But the material touched on is very thermodynamic in, in, in nature. A few, years ago, a few years ago, Misha Lukin's group at Harvard using a Rydberg atom simulator uh, hit upon the phenomenon of quantum many-body scars. And that kicked off an entire subfield of quantum many-body scars. These are high energy eigenstates of quantum many-body systems. The Hamiltonians look like they ought to be chaotic, they ought to be non-integrable, so their energy eigenstates ought to have lots of entanglement in them. If you look at a small subsystem, it should look thermal, but there are a few anomalous high energy energy eigenstates that just break this expectation. So they are in some sense resistant to a lot of thermal expectations. So I would argue that quantum computers, which I would say include quantum simulators, even though those are not universal, have already done a lot for, for advancing discoveries that are thermodynamics related. Another area of research that I think is very hopeful that involves using quantum computers to learn about thermodynamic questions is lattice gauge theory. Gauge theories include the theories of elementary particle physics. For instance, we learn in a lecture dynamics class about how there is a gauge freedom. We can choose which gauge to use. Similarly, the strong force is described by the theory of QCD. And that is a gauge theory. How thermalization happens or whether thermalization happens or whether we can even define thermalization in these gauge theories is uh, controversial, not at all settled. We kind of expect thermalization to happen, but these systems are very strongly interacting. So it's difficult to pin down what thermalization even would mean. But there is a field of work on leveraging quantum computers in order to simulate lattice gauge theories. And so we might be able to experiment to see to what extent thermalization can be said to happen. Okay, so Jake's original question, I think, was can quantum computing help us resolve issues in the foundations of quantum physics? We seem to have moved on to can quantum computers help us make progress in quantum thermodynamics more broadly? I would say yes to both, really strongly. This is something I'm very interested in. In terms of the second one, so can quantum computing help us in quantum thermodynamics? As I see it, there are two main areas in which quantum computers can help. Um, the first one, um, Nicole and Marcus both talked about, so and this is quantum simulation. Um, so being able to simulate many body systems includes the ability to simulate thermal phenomena in many body systems particularly if you can do things like prepare thermal states, which is a non-trivial problem and something that many of us in this room have actually discussed over the course of this week. But yeah, if you can stimulate many body quantum systems and thermalization phenomena in many body quantum systems, there's many questions you can answer. You can study diffusion, there's all sorts you can look at. It's an amazingly powerful tool. Okay, so quantum simulation, one thing you can do. Another thing you can do, and this is more one of my pet projects, is I'm really interested in using quantum computing power to process the quantum data from quantum experiments. So classical computing power is routinely used to process data from quantum experiments. I mean, that's just how experiments work. You're not writing the data down on pen and paper and then doing the calculations by hand. You use a classical computer to process it. But if you're experimenting on a quantum system, surely it makes sense to use a quantum computer to process the quantum data. It's sort of a bit like Feynman's um, standard over quoted quote. The nature isn't classical, damn it. Um, if you want to simulate it, make it quantum mechanical. Well, if you're dealing with a quantum experiment, your data isn't classical, damn it. If you want to process it, make it quantum mechanical. So I think that's another area 
potentially in which quantum computers, longer term, not right now, could prove useful. We could use them in quantum thermodynamic experiments to process our data better. Okay, so that was how can quantum computing help us in quantum thermodynamics? Can quantum computing also help us resolve foundational issues? This is a harder one, but there are papers trying to do it. Um, so I presented one yesterday trying to find consistent histories. So consistent histories is sometimes presented as the Copenhagen interpretation done right, but actually trying to find consistent histories is a computationally really intensive task, but it's easier to do on a quantum computer. I'm also involved in a project, have been involved for a couple of years now, it's a really fun project that we're not anywhere close to wrapping up because it's hard and fun, on trying to figure out how ubiquitous subsystems are in physics. So say you take just a random Hamiltonian, can you interpret that Hamiltonian as pertaining to two approximately classical, approximately non-interacting subsystems? And if you can, what do they look like? The subsystems we see around us the whole time look like sort of, I don't know, they're well-defined in position. That's, that's, how we, that's how we identify systems, but do they just look like that because of our anthropological bias, or is the sub notion of subsystems more general? I mean, I'm, I'm just rambling to some extent here, but I just wanted to give you a taste of a foundational question that you might try and answer using quantum computing that I've been enjoying. So, not always obvious how you could use quantum computing to resolve foundational issues, but I think if you poke hard at it, you can sometimes make progress. Mm -hmm. um, we'll just take this one. I'm good. Okay, um, yeah, so actually this, this question, um, as someone who doesn't come really from a quantum computing background, I find really interesting, and I would say that I, I think that yes, that's one of the most exciting things as a th theoretical physicist who's not necessarily uh, a quantum computing person, that you, know, you can sort of analyze the development of quantum computing you know, as a condensed matter physicist or as a statistical mechanic, um, and just to kind of take back a little bit of kind of history in, in, in science is that there are many very good examples. So we often think about basic and fundamental science leading to advances in technology, but the flip side is also true. There's historical, you know, sort of very well, sort of, um, um, you know, good, sorry, very good examples of historically of situations where the technology of the day that was being driven for whatever reason, whether that was steam engines, the industrial revolution, or for example, the or if people might find it funny, but in the origins of quantum mechanics, Max Planck's PhD thesis was because they wanted to improve street lighting in Germany, and he discovered, uh, you know, sort of quantum mechanics, the first quantum mechanics result by desperation, essentially trying to, you know, put a quantized energy into a Boltzmann and like formula, right? So, so I mean, you know, that's very, very nice. And I think if you look at the current era that we're in, where we don't have fault tolerant quantum computers and we have these sort of noisy scale devices. From a condensed matter perspective, these are very interesting because, you know, in a gate-based simulation, you're essentially doing some sort of stro stroboscopic time evolution, you know, on top of an open system where the noise source is unknown. And I think, you know, as a statistical mechanic or as a condensed matter physicist, that's actually really interesting to try to understand, you know, is there universal features, for example, in certain trotterization schemes? You know, what is the origin of noise? Can you say something about the black box of noise from inferring measurements on your device. So I think these are all brilliant questions for theoretical physicists. I mean, maybe they're very far away from, you know, applications that drive invest or in investment or VC capital, but, you know, in the end, we're physicists, right? So we shouldn't care about that. Okay. So um, thank you again, everyone. I think that was extremely insightful and somehow like a, uh, almost a call to arms. Um, I feel like we only have time for one um, a question uh, to keep uh, up with our uh, original time. So uh, I'll just head to the last question or maybe give you the opportunity to do two things if you choose so. So let's say part A. Um, so in classical computation and in sort of the classical computer science, there's this idea of complexity classes, right? Um, and there are various ones. Um, but also the idea of, of time and spatial complexity, right? You can keep track of the, the way you're using these resources and how they scale um, uh, as, as the, the size of your problem gets larger. Now, in the world of quantum computation, we've been able to sometimes um, look at this idea of a thermodynamic cost, right? So if we sort of take these two ideas and try to marry them, do you guys think that you can have something like one complexity class 
um, or, or a notion of a complexity class, like a group of quantum algorithms that sort of require more work than some easier class of quantum algorithms. This is this something you envisage happening. So that's like, let's say, part A. And then part B, maybe you can all close off and give a nice call to arms, like, I think you should work on this. OK, so that's the last that's one. The last one. <laughs> we can start, we can start, we can start, we can start uh, John and work our way up to Alexia. Fully understands uh, <laughs> your question, Jake. That's the honest truth. I think part A, the question just got out. Though. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, first of all, when people start mentioning complexity classes to me, I kind of look at them with sort of <laughs> doe eyes because I'm not a computer scientist. So I think I'd rather stay out of the discussion. To be honest with you, I'd only be wildly speculating. <laughs> and then maybe a call to arms, then John. I mean. Leave complexity classes to computer scientists. <laughs> <laughs> a call to arms. Yeah. Um, do whatever you think is interesting, and I think um, you know, I, you know, that's ultimately what science is about. And some things that are interesting to you will never, will won't be interesting to other people. And if you continue doing science like that, in the end, every now and again, you know you get some profound insight or some universal insight. That mightn't happen. If you're lucky, you might have one good idea in your life. Uh, Einstein had two. So, you know, do whatever you're, you're interested in. That's all I'd say. Um, yeah, part A, ask Scott Hamilton is my take. Um, <laughs> or have a look on his blog. He might have already written about it. He seems to have written about everything on that blog. Um, part B, mine would probably be try and get quantum simulation to work on near-term hardware. Once we've got that, there's fuck loads we can do. Um, so, yeah, see if you can get that to work. I'll say a bit about complexity. I would argue that energetic complexity classes already exist and are distinguished by nature. For instance, when we do elementary particle physics, then we think about um, particles that can be created or destroyed that pop in and out of existence. If a particle is ex ha very, very heavy, so it requires a lot of energy to create, then the probability that it's going to be created is very, very low. So we could say that it's energy suppressed. And that is one reason why particle accelerators like the LHC have to be built, because we want to study very heavy particles. And so we need lots and lots of high energy data because the particles we're interested in are so energy suppressed that they're just unlikely to be realized. On a different note, there is a type of complexity that has uh, already been incorporated into a kind of thermodynamic paradigm. It involves quantum many body systems. So suppose that we define a type of complexity, the complexity of a quantum state as the minimum number of two cubic gates or local operations that you would need to prepare the state from a simple tensor product. Suppose that you have a quantum many body system that's started in some simple tensor product state and is now evolving under some interesting, chaotic, non-integrable type Hamiltonian. Thermalization happens in many steps in a quantum many body system. Information will scramble across the system. So there will come to be um, many body entanglement that spreads across the system so that if you initially poke the system, the information about the poke will end up spread all across many, many degrees of freedom. There is also local thermalization. So if you look at a small subsystem or look at a local observable, you measure its expectation value, the expectation value will come to look as though the small system were in the appropriate thermal state. Another stage of quantum many body thermalization that's been studied a lot recently in holography and condensed matter and quantum information theory is that of complexity saturation. So the complexity of the quantum state, the minimum number of two qubit gates you would need to prepare the state, will, um, in these very random, uh, under these random chaotic non integrable dynamics, um, that's expected to grow linearly for a time exponentially large in the system size until the complexity saturates at a value that is exponentially large in the system size. So 
I think of complexity as a very late stage of quantum many body thermalization. I'm not sure I fully understood correctly the question, but anyway, uh, when you define complexity, complexity classes of an algorithm, typically you do in terms of resources. So if you, if you describe the computation in terms of Turing machine, you describe it in terms of the time it takes uh, uh, for an algorithm to solve it. On the other hand, you can use the quantum gate, the, the, the gate paradigm, and again, you look at how big is the, how scales your, uh, your, um, how scales your 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 uh, network I mean uh, gate network to solve the problem so again you probably possibly you can quantify uh, the complexity of a problem in, in terms of the minimum energetic uh, cost of the computation itself uh, according i mean uh, uh, again e either with a specific computational model in mind or you can even think of in general on whatever kind of computational platform you have in mind Yeah, uh, wonderful question. I also, I, I struggle with computational complexity classes, but I would say that some notion of complexity, maybe not the typical computer science version, just play a huge role in quantum versions of thermodynamics. Because what is really different as opposed to classical thermodynamics that in many of the papers you see and in many of the works and also in all of the quantum technologies, we suddenly have control over microscopic degrees of freedom. And this opens up all of these exciting new possibilities, but it, as we said, it comes with a cost that is orders of magnitude higher, but that cost is also mitigated by complexity. So just one random example from our own group recently is that, uh, for instance, like what does it take to saturate Landauer's bound? Well, you can take infinite time, right? Uh, Thermalize a system slowly, infinitely slowly, uh, take infinitely many two qubit dates to slowly formalize, but then you cool down at lambda cost. Or you can use infinitely complex Hamiltonians with infinite interaction range or uh, some infinite dimensionality and so on and so forth. So I, I think if, if we want to consistently talk about quantum thermodynamics, especially things like the resource theory approach where you're like the, the maps generated essentially are generated by unitaries on system plus an ancilla, but these unitaries need to be constrained somehow in complexity, otherwise some things get trivialized. So I do feel complexity has more of a role to play in quantum thermal in the future. And as a call to arms, as Jake has called it, I mean, uh, apart from a general political one, which I will refrain from now, I, I would just 100% subscribe to what John said. I mean. I think curiosity driven research ultimately is the reason I'm here ultimately was the reason behind any of the innovations. And even if it weren't, it. Okay, so I have, I have the last to speak, right? Um, so I will, I will make it short and also because my brain is a simplifying machine at this time of the day and of the week. <laughs> So what I understood from the from the question with the complexity classes, to me, it's, it's also related to the quantum energy advantage, basically. Uh, the fact that with a quantum computer, we can compute with less steps than the classical computer, and it could be translated into less resources, as Massimo says. And this is worth exploring, taking into account the fact that uh, we need in the resources that we use to do our comp quantum computation, we need to take into account the cost of the classical control and isolate the processors uh, from the external world. And we actually don't know if this cost uh, will still allow us to get an energy advantage of no or not, uh, as if we were sticking to the quantum level. And as far as the, uh, how did you call it? The work? Cold world, cold. I, I did not understand, but uh, uh, the, the the last word I would like to say is um, if base. So it will be a shameless advertisement, but if you are interested in this uh, kind of questions that we have uh, shaken uh, along this roundtable, we are with a few colleagues launching a, a, a quantum energy initiative, 
So if you Google quantum energy initiative, you find this. And basically, it's acknowledging the fact that quantum thermodynamics is a very important community to address the question of the energy cost of quantum technologies. But we need to also discuss with other people, like people who do the quantum software, people who do like uh, the quantum algorithms, people who do the enabling technologies, because they are the big resource that must be taken into account. And to have this uh, like space for interdisciplinary dialogue, uh, we are launching a poll and a manifesto. So again, quantum energy initiative, is, if you are interested, we need fresh ideas. Thank you. So um, I'll just wrap it up here. Um, thank you to our um, speakers for joining this call and for their immense patience and kindness whilst we sorted out um, uh, our audio um, issues up front. It's been uh, very enjoyable, really. Sort of, I'm sure this will be a memorable conversation. Um, uh, I really enjoyed hearing all of your opinions and your call to arms. Um, thank you for coming. Hopefully we can have all of you here in person in some other iteration. And uh, yeah, thanks. So let's give them a big round of applause.